Hello, and thank you for watching Mount Carmel Health Partners Webinar of the Month. My name is Erin Frisk, Program Manager of Risk Encoding Accuracy, and I will be your host for today's webinar, Major Depressive Disorder, Bipolar, and Schizophrenia. Next slide, please. In order to receive the incentive for your time and attention, we ask that you watch this presentation in its entirety by November 22nd. Fill out the webinar, add its patient, and W9, and return to Health Partners no later than November 22nd. If you have questions throughout today's presentation, please feel free to contact Desiree Corbin or myself through our contact information listed at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. Before I introduce our speaker and we start discussing specific, the specifics, let's review some risk adjustment essentials. Should I say that slide again, Desiree? I think oh, no, just... I should be able to that. It's okay. Okay. Risk adjustment is the methodology by which CMS determines how to adequately allocate resources to Medicare Advantage plans for patient care. Both demographic and clinical factors determine resource allocation. Demographic examples include patient age, gender, institutional status, and Medicaid status. The largest clinical factors include chronic conditions that have been shown in CMS data to require more resources. As you know, there are 70,000 diagnosis codes included in ICD-10-CM. Every year, each diagnosis code is evaluated using CMS data to determine which codes utilize the most resources. Once that is done, the data is normalized so that the average Medicare Advantage patient has a risk score of about one. Around 9,500 diagnostic codes are determined to affect risk and they map to what is called a hierarchical condition category or an HCC. An HCC is a group of condition is a group of chronic condition diagnoses that are clinically similar and have been determined to have similar effect on resource utilization, what is called their weight. These weights are what calculate the clinical portion of a patient's risk score, which will be discussed on the next slide. There are 86 HCCs that are included in the 2022 risk adjustment model. For a diagnosis to be captured on the claim, it must have support in the documentation within the record. An easy way to remember documentation requirements is an acronym, an acronym MEET, which stands for Monitor, Evaluate, Assess, and Treat. Only one of these elements needs to be present for each diagnosis taken into medical decision making. As telehealth has become more frequently used with Medicare Advantage population due to the COVID-19 pandemic, it is important to note which modes of health, telehealth communication are acceptable for risk adjustment and closing HCC gaps. In order for telehealth visits to be eligible for risk adjustment, the visit must take place with real-time audio and video capabilities by an approved provider for risk adjustment, such as an MD, DO, PA, or CMP. Most importantly, it must be documented in the medical record that the visit was completed over telehealth with synchronous or real-time audio and video services used. Documenting this in the medical record will help keep the visit compliant with CMS when capturing and closing HCC gaps throughout the year. Next slide, please. Before we jump into today's topic, I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Daniel Wendorf. Dr. Wendorf is the President and Chief Medical Officer of Health Partners and a board-certified internist. He practiced as a primary care physician in Grove City for 25 years prior to joining Health Partners in 2009, and is an expert in alternative payment models, clinical integration, and population health. Welcome, Dr. Wendorf. Thank you, Erin. It's a pleasure to be here and discuss this important topic with you all today. Major depressive disorder, commonly referred to as depression, has been identified as a leading cause of disability worldwide with over 8 million depressed, depression-related provider visits annually, and over half of those visits occur in a primary care setting. Untreated depression can result in emotional suffering, reduced productivity, self-harm, and suicide attempts and completion. In 2017, a study revealed at least one half of patients who completed suicide had contact with their primary care physician within a month before their death. Building an in-depth understanding of major depressive disorder, including diagnostic criteria, empowers providers to identify and manage this common disorder. 
Due to the relationship between the biologic and psychosocial factors, depression can be a complicated diagnosis to make. Regular screenings are recommended for all adults during provider visits. This slide is a refresher of the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for diagnosing major depressive disorders. As you'll remember, as you'll remember patients must experience five or more of the listed symptoms during the same two-week period, and at least one of the reported symptoms must be included in the top two, either depressed mood or markedly diminished pleasure in activities. As you know, these diagnostic symptoms are not exclusive, and patients also often present with irritability, brooding, obsessive rumination, and are likely to report anxiety, phobias, excessive worrying about physical health, and complaints of pain. In the elderly population, common symptoms include difficulty sleeping, unexplained physical pain, GI problems, frequent tearfulness and pacing or fidgeting. Older adults are at risk of misdiagnosis or lack of treatment due to symptoms mimicking age-related issues, medication complications, or life changes. This patient population may be reluctant to discuss feelings. In addition, depression can be triggered or worsened by chronic medical conditions such as cancer, Parkinson's, and dementia, to name a few. The number of patients Screening with moderate to severe symptoms of depression has continued to increase since 2020 and, the, and remains higher than rates prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. It is believed that these increases stem at least in part from social isolation during quarantine and from fear of the pandemic. While this increased depression is seen over the entire population, it is especially noted in the elderly. Next slide, please. Let's talk further about screening. Due to the range of symptoms patients can experience, screening tools like the PHQ-9 are essential for detection and proper diagnosis. The PHQ-9, a diagnostic tool recommended by DSM-5, can easy, easily and quickly be administered during any visit and can help providers determine the severity of a patient's condition. On this slide, we have included a table that includes PHQ-9 score brackets, the score explanation, and the ICD-10 suggestions for each level of severity. You should note that just because a patient scores as, a, as mild does not mean they don't have major depression. Any patient that you have diagnosed and treated with medication or counseling for depression is by definition a major depressive disorder. You will note that F32.9 and F32A are the ICD codes used for the unspecified depression. When the severity is not specified, the condition is not risk adjusted in the HCC model that Aaron described. Unless the severity of depression is truly unknown at the time of evaluation of the patient, there should always be a documentation stating what severity of depression the patient has experienced. This will not only help with accurate documentation, but it also truly reflects the patient's burden of illness. Next slide, please. When known, the four essential details to include in documentation are whether the patient is experiencing a single or recurrent episode of depression, the severity, remission status if applicable, and whether psychotic features are present. A single episode is considered a period of two or more weeks with symptoms. Recurrent, when a patient has experienced a depressive episode in the past and is, in, and is currently having symptoms that require treatment or management. If the patient is currently taking med prescribed medication or is receiving therapy services, their depression is considered recurrent. Mild, moderate, or severe should be documented in the medical record. And if the patient is experiencing severe depression, make note of if psychotic features such as hearing voices are present. There are two levels of remission, partial and full. 
A partial remission diagnosis is appropriate for patients with significant improvement of the condition with mild symptoms still present. Patients in full remission are described as symptom-free, even if controlled with treatment. Always include at least one element of meat within the medical record to show that depression was assessed during the visit as well as the recurrence. This can include review, reviewing or prescribing medication, referring to a specialist, or reviewing the PHQ-9 with the patient. Next slide, please. Here we are comparing two examples of depression documentation. These are both the same patient, Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith has a history of depression and he is, he is currently on Effexor. The poor documentation basically states that Mr. Smith has a history of depression, but doesn't note that he has a current, uh, a recurrent major depressive disorder, which is currently mild um, controlled by medication. It just says history of depression. His assessment and plan lists depression. Now, although depression is a commonly used term to, to mean major depressive disorder, it is best to document major depressive disorder, recurrent, mild, and then Effexor is refilled today, which, which is taking care of the problem. That will give you an assigned code of the, the F33.0 and will meet all of the criteria necessary for HCC coding. Next slide, please. Let's move on to bipolar disorder. Next slide. When coding and documentation for, di for bipolar disorder, it's important to be meticulous in documenting details and accurately selecting codes that best reflect the patient's burden of illness. You can see from this slide that bipolar disorder is a very complicated disorder. Instead of using nonspecific such as bipolar disorder, it is best to specify if the patient is type 1 or type 2, current or if they're in remission, manic or mixed, the severity, and the presence or absence of psychotic features, if any. Bipolar 2 disorder is characterized by a minimum of one hypomanic episode and one major depressive symptom. The main difference between bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 is the severity of the manic episodes caused by each type. Patient diagnosed, patients diagnosed with bipolar 1 will experience a full manic episode, while a patient with bipolar 2 will experience only hypomania. What is the difference between hypomania and, and mania? Hypomania is essentially a less severe form of mania. Hypomania lasts at least four days, but is not severe enough to affect social features and does not require or involve hospitalization. Mania lasts for at least a week, causes severe impact on social features and could require hospitalization. Specifiers such as severity and presence of psychotic features cannot be coded, but should be documented. The mood disorder questionnaire or the MDQ while not diagnostic, is an effective screening tool for bipolar disorder. A positive screen must be followed by clinical assessment to determine the diagnosis. Mixed episodes of bipolar disorder are symptoms of mania and depression that occur at the same time or in rapid sequence. Mania with mixed features usually involves irritability, high energy, and racing thoughts or speech. It is important to note that if depression is diagnosed, it is not appropriate to code and bill for bipolar disorder in the same visit. These conditions should not be coded or billed together as depression is considered inclusive to bipolar disorder per ICD-10 guidelines. Next slide, please. On this slide, we have provided a chart including specified bipolar and ICD-10 codes. Additional characters can be added to specify severity and presence of psychotic features. We have also included codes for patients experiencing bipolar in relation to psychological conditions. Next slide, please. So now we'll move on to schizophrenia. Next slide, please. Schizophrenia is a severe mental illness that affects the way people think, feel, and perceive. 
Individuals 55 and older will soon account for more than 25% of the total population of patients with schizophrenia worldwide. Older patients with schizophrenia include individuals with early onset that persists into later in life and those with late onset of this condition. In order to confirm the diagnosis, patients must report at least two of the following symptoms, delusions, disorganized or catatonic behavior, disorganized speech, hallucinations, and other negative symptoms that are present most of the time within a four week period. Symptoms can vary in type and severity over time with periods of worsening and remission of symptoms. Some symptoms may always be present. Schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorders can share many of the same symptoms such as hallucinations and, dis and delusions. The main difference between schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorders is that the schizoaffective disorder must have symptoms of a mood disorder in addition to a psychotic symptom. This slide is a breakdown of the spe specified codes in each category. Next slide, please. Differentiating between schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease with psychosis in older adults can be difficult, but there are distinguishing features shown here. The prevalence of de dementia in older adults with schizophrenia is expected to increase significantly. Older patients with schizophrenia are twice as likely to develop dementia before the age of 80 when compared with the general population. To wrap up our presentation today, we will discuss some important takeaways from the content. When known, it is important to document and code chronic conditions such as bipolar and major depressive disorder to the highest level of specificity that is accurate and reflects patient burden of illness. Avoid using broad terms such as patient has bipolar or patient has depression. Specify in the documentation the severity of the patient's current episode and whether or not they are experiencing psychotic features. The documentation must reflect and support the level of specification in the ICD-10 code. Depression and bipolar should not be coded and billed together as they are considered inclusive. There is no relationship between dementia and older patients and schizophrenia. If you are interested in a further deep dive into a depression documentation and coding, please visit the Mount Carmel Health Partners website for previous webinars and other educational content. Next slide, please. This is our disclaimer. Next slide, please. Here's our references. Next slide. And here's our contact information. Please feel free to reach out to um, either Desiree or myself for any questions. And um, please return fax attestations by November 22nd. Thank you. <laughs>